Okay, uh, we finally have gotten to the topic uh, of the new birth or of initial sanctification, uh, as, as we say, uh, the topic of the new birth and initial sanctification. Uh, we can use these terms simultaneously and interchangeably. The new birth, regeneration, initial sanctification. All of these terms would be interchangeable. We can use them, we can use them interchangeably. Uh, and so when we think of the doctrine of the new birth, uh, Wesley taught in his sermon whose title was the new birth, he taught that the foundation of regeneration is the entire corruption of our nature. In other words, being born in sin, we need to be born again. And so Wesley is seeing a connection between the doctrine of original sin on the one hand and then the doctrine of the new birth on the other. Being born in sin, we must be born again, okay? Uh, and so the new birth then is that great change which God works in the soul when he brings it into life, when he brings it into life, okay? Uh, and so, we talk about the importance of the new birth, the importance of the new birth uh, in terms of becoming holy, becoming holy. Uh, and so Wesley talks about the new birth in order to be holy because without holiness, as scripture says, no one will see the Lord. Uh, and then secondly, uh, none can be happy in this world or the next without being born of God, without being born again. As we indicated earlier in the historical part of the course, all unholy dispositions of the heart are uneasy tempers. They are uneasy tempers, okay? Uh, and so... Holiness or regeneration or the new birth will be necessary, will be necessary uh, in order to be happy, in order to be happy in this world, okay? Now, in his sermon, the marks of the new birth, the marks of the new birth, because we have to describe what the new birth is, and it has marks, traits, characteristics, that we can use to describe it. And what are the marks of the new birth? It's very simple, very simple. There are three marks of the new birth. What are those three marks? Well, the theological virtues. Do you know what the theological <coughs> virtues are? Faith, hope, love. Faith, hope, and love, these are the theological virtues and these are the marks of the new birth. These are the characteristics of the new birth. Faith, hope, and love. Yes. So, when we talk about the first mark of the new birth, which would be faith, okay? We already know that Wesley has a rich understanding of faith. We know that now. He has a full-orbed understanding of faith. And he says, he writes in terms of this first mark of the new birth, which is faith. Faith is not simply an assent, but it is also a trust, a trust in God that through the merits of Christ, my sins are forgiven. Uh, that's what Wesley writes. Now watch this, and then... Wesley argues that a fruit of this faith, in other words, what's a fruit, a consequence of this kind of faith, this regenerating faith? Wesley argues it is power over sin 
and that the children of God are distinguished from the children of the devil by the mark of not committing sin. Okay? Now, I have to unpack that for you. I have to explain it for you so you don't misunderstand. Okay? Uh, you will recall, you will recall that earlier, we, it was one of the first things we did in this course, but we talked about Wesley's definition of sin, which is for Wesley a willful violation of a known law of God. You'll recall yeah. that that's what we said. Sin is a willful violation of a known law of God. Okay, And with that understanding uh, of sin in place, with that understanding of sin in place, now we can talk about the liberty, the liberty of the new birth in terms of its first mark, that is freedom, uh, that is faith. Faith expressed, Wesley says, particularly as power over sin, that the children of God are distinguished from the children of the devil by the mark of not committing sin. So, what's Wesley saying here? Let's put this in other words and as he does in other contexts. Those who are born of God, those who are born of God, Wesley's going to argue, do not commit sin. And, and some people, even in his own day, said, oh, what you mean is they don't commit sin habitually. Okay? And Wesley is going to uh, reject that exception. Uh, he says, I don't see that in the text, the, the word habitually, okay? That someone, one who is born of God, one who is born of God, uh, does not commit sin, does not commit sin, meaning that they're not under the power and dominion of sin so long as they remain in saving grace, okay? So long as they remain in saving grace. Now, one way that people misunderstand this, and there are many ways to misunderstand what I've just said, but one way of misunderstanding this is to say, well, then Wesley's teaching that Christians will never sin again. Uh, he's not saying that. Uh, he's not saying it because he knows that even after one is born of God, uh, there may be the breaking of faith with God at some point, okay? Um, but at that point, what, what one would have to do is repent, do the first works afresh, and be restored, okay? Um, so, uh, but Wesley is saying, Wesley is saying that a Christian so long as they remain in saving faith, and they can remain in saving faith for a long time, they can walk with God, they will not sin. They will not sin. They will not break faith with God. Um, the power of sin will be broken in their lives. Now, how can I summarize this teaching? How can I summarize this teaching so that you understand the liberty involved without misunderstanding the liberty involved. I can do it this way. Now, the words I'm going to use right now are my words. They're not Wesley's words, but I think they do express the many things that he's teaching in this area, and I've brought it again. For, for many people in the church today, they don't affirm this teaching at all. They say, oh, we sin in thought, word, and deed every day. That's what they say. They teach that. We, we're only sinners. Uh, we're only redeemed sinners. We sin in thought, word, and deed every day. Sometimes they'll even say we're only human, but no Christian should simply say that. Uh, so there is a greater liberty here than that would acknowledge. There is a greater liberty here, okay? Uh, and so... How do I want to affirm that liberty, but also recognize, as 1 John talks about, if anyone does sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay? Uh, that is also. And then scripture saying, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? Wesley has commentary on those verses as well uh, in uh, his notes upon the New Testament. So taking all those things and putting them together, here's what I would say. Here's what I would say um, would express what Wesley is arguing here. That the open, willful committing of sin, in other words, breaking faith with God, breaking faith, should be the grave exception in the Christian life and not the rule. I mean, I think that summarizes what Wesley is saying here. Um, that we have grace sufficient to walk in the freedom and power and the liberty of regenerating grace. We have that. We can walk that. And we can remain in that walk. Okay? Uh, and that has been the testimony of many Christians. Uh, that they walk in that grace and power day by day. It's a daily, uh, a daily thing. You only have today, okay? Um, but if anyone did sin, okay, well, then they would have to repent. They would have to repent, uh, be restored, um, and, and be renewed into the grace of God. So there is a precious liberty that Wesley's talking about here. It's the liberty of the new birth. Um, and it's freedom from the power and dominion of sin. Okay, let me tell you a little story from Brooklyn. This, this, was, this goes back to Brooklyn. This represents my own evangelical conversion. I grew up in Roman Catholicism, uh, raised in that tradition, and I didn't come, I myself did not come to the proper Christian faith or to real, true, proper scriptural Christianity uh, till I was a young man of 22 years old. And at that time, uh, prior to that time, a retired free Methodist minister had me read, you know, I was 21 at the time, had me read John Wesley's 52 standard sermons, which I devoured. I mean, I read them and I said, wow, no one ever taught me this. No one ever taught me this. Uh, and so in reading scripture on the one hand, uh, and John Wesley's 52 sermons on the other, uh, and prayer and counsel uh, by Arthur Albrecht, who was the retired Free Methodist minister, I entered into the liberty of the gospel. Uh, that is freedom from the guilt of sin, freedom from its power. Um, and I remember it was months, months after my evangelical conversion, and Arthur said, let's go to a messianic group a messianic group in Brooklyn, in other words, a group that has special ministry to Jews uh, to win them to Christ. And I said, fine. And, you know, and we walked everywhere. It was a couple of miles, and we walked to this place. Um, and then in the context of the service, uh, the pastor said, it's testimony time. Does anybody have a testimony? And so... You know, I was still in the full flushes of my conversion experience, so I stood up and I gave witness to this kind of liberty that we can have in Jesus Christ. Freedom not only from the guilt of sin, but also from its power as well. And then I was actually quoting the first letter of John. You're all familiar with the first letter of John and the liberty it talks about? I was quoting the first letter of John. And all of a sudden, the pastor stood up and he shouted, he shouted, stop! We cannot have this here. We cannot have this here. We have people who have come all the way from New Jersey and you say this. So, kind of sheepishly and humbly, I looked to Arthur Albrecht and he gave me a look, you know, as if assuring it's okay. So I, I sat down, I sat down, uh, and the service continued. After the service was over, there was a lunch, you know, sitting around the table, eating food, 
And you know me, I'm a little whippersnapper. I am. You know I'm going to be saying something to the pastor. You know it. You know it's coming. You know it's coming. So we're sitting around the table and we're eating. And I said to the pastor, I addressed him, I said, Pastor, I said, I love your hymnology. I love the hymns that we sang this morning. What was that again? What was that verse again, Pastor? Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. I said, I love your hymns. And the woman sitting next to me dropped her spoon at the time. She got it right away. Boom. Whoa. They were teaching one theology and they were singing another theology. But praise be for the hymns because they had good gospel truth in them. Okay. And so I don't want you to get the impression that there's not a great liberty here because there is. But we do have to talk about the exception, the grave exception, when we break faith with God, okay? But I would think, you know, I would think as we grow in grace and faith, as we learn to love God more deeply, we will hate sin. Hate. That, we, I'm using the word hate in a proper context. We will hate sin. And we will not want to displease the one who has given us so much. That's what it is to grow deeper and deeper into the grace of God. So we're saying lots of things all at once. Uh, we're trying to hold it together here uh, to reflect the liberty and the freedom that is in the first letter of John, for example, that's in Romans 6, that's in Romans 8. Um, you know, there was a Pentecostal pastor one time, and uh, we were discussing, we were talking about this, and he said, you know, you know how I... I deal with people who, who object to the freedom that we have in Christ. I tell them, read the first letter of John every day for a whole month. Read the whole thing, the first letter of John, for 30 days in a row. By the end of those 30 days, you will be convinced. You will be convinced that this is a liberty of the gospel, okay? A liberty of the gospel. Yes, yeah, and, and there is hallelujah because what we could not do by ourselves, what we failed again and again and again, frustration and failure, God does by grace through faith. We receive it as a gift and we walk and we say in gratitude and thankfulness, thank you, thank you, thank you for your rich grace, your rich presence in our lives that is a transforming presence that frees us from the guilt of sin, but also uh, from its power. So, when Wesley talks about faith as a mark of the new birth, he's talking about faith that delivers from the power and dominion of sin, and it's a precious liberty uh, for Christians to enjoy. And you know what we mean now by sin because we've gone over that very carefully, okay? Well, um, what is the second mark of the new birth? We know it is hope. We know it is hope, the second theological virtue. And so the second mark of the new birth is hope. And Wesley's going to talk about this mark principally in terms of his doctrine of assurance. Okay, so when Wesley is talking about hope, the theological virtue of hope, he's talking about assurance, the assurance of the Holy Spirit with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, that's the direct witness of the spirit, and that's what we mean by you know, the direct witness, but then there is also an indirect witness of the Spirit, uh, and Wesley is going to talk about that indirect witness in terms of conscience, 
Our conscience will give us witness that we're a child of God. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, that will be an indirect witness uh, that we are a child of God. Um, uh, obeying, obedience, at, we're walking, obeying God, that's an indirect evidence, an indirect evidence that we're a child of God. Okay? And so Wesley talks about two witnesses, two testimonies in terms of hope, in terms of this topic of assurance, uh, and we'll talk about the testimony of our own spirit first, and Wesley wrote a particular sermon just on this topic, just on the topic of the witness of our own spirit, uh, and this is what he wrote. In terms of the testimony of our own spirit, uh, we can look at such things as mar the marks of the children of God, which would be the fruits of the Spirit. We see the fruits in the Spirit in our lives. Therefore, we can make the conclusion, I must be a child of God. So if we see the fruit of the Spirit in our life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, we can conclude, I must be a child of God because these fruit are in my life. Uh, then we can see it in terms indirectly of conscience, our conscience. Paul talked about, what did Paul write about? He had a conscience of, of no offense. In other words, his conscience was clear. Paul talked about his conscience was clear. He lived that way. That's how Paul lived, okay? Um, having a conscience that had no offense. Uh, and so if we have a conscience of no offense, this is indirect evidence. It's not direct evidence. We have to make the conclusion, ah, I must be a child of God. Okay? Or if we see that in our lives we are obeying God, we're walking in the obedience of faith, and by the way, obedience is a very important word, a very important word, because it's intimately connected with faith. And scripture talks about the obedience of faith, that faith is acted out in obedience. Faith is acted out in obedience. That is the expression of faith, uh, obeying. Uh, Jesus said, he who loves me will keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. Well. That's obedience. Uh, he who loves Christ will obey Christ, will walk in the obedience of faith. What is it then to have faith in Christ? In some sense, it is to be obedient, to obey, uh, to obey Christ. Uh, and so these would be some of the evidences that we call the first testimony of our own spirit, okay? But then beyond that, Beyond that, there is the testimony of God's Spirit. So Wesley's going to write about hope in terms of assurance, and here in terms of not the indirect witness, but here in terms of the direct witness, meaning the direct witness of the Holy Spirit with our hearts that we are a child of God. And so this is what Wesley writes. God's spirit bears witness with our own spirit that we are the children of God. The spirit's testimony must be antecedent to the testimony of our own spirit. We must be holy of heart before we can be conscious that we are so. Okay. Uh, and so Wesley fills out a theology uh, of the marks of the new birth, a theology of hope here, uh, specifically in terms of the question of assurance. Now, why are there two witnesses? Why are there two witnesses? Why isn't there just the witness of the spirit? In other words, the direct witness. Why is there this witness of our own spirit? Why do we need that? Why do we need two witnesses and not just not just the one, okay? Well, <laughs> if we denied the direct witness of the Spirit, 
So in other words, if, if we said all that there is are these evidences through conscience, the fruit of the spirit, obeying in terms of commandments, that sort of thing, then all of that could easily degenerate into formality and maybe even justification by works. There would be that danger. There would be that danger, okay? And so um, Wesley's going to argue that uh, the direct witness of the Spirit over and above, beyond these indirect witnesses, is necessary. It's necessary. It's the one grand part of the testimony which God has given to the Methodists, okay? Now, let me express this in another way by uh, evidences from Wesley's own life. And here I'm summarizing his relationships with Anglican clergy. Watch this. Anglican clergy had no problem with John Wesley saying, affirming the indirect witness. They had no problem with that. If John Wesley said, ah, I have the fruit of the Spirit in my life, love and joy and peace, they had no problem with that. But they had a huge problem, and they criticized Wesley unceasingly when he talked about a direct witness, the Holy Spirit directly witnessing with his spirit that he was a child of God. They called that enthusiasm. We would call that today, we would translate that today, fanaticism, okay? So the Anglicans had no problem with the indirect witness of, of the spirit, in other words, the fruit of the spirit, but to talk about the Holy Spirit actually witnessing with our spirit that we're a child of God, that was too much for them. And they criticized Wesley again and again and again. You probably have heard that Wesley has been criticized principally for his doctrine of entire sanctification. And he was criticized for that. But lots of the criticism that is directed at Wesley in the 18th century is that he affirms the reality of the Holy Spirit and that reality of the Holy Spirit can be known by the believer. That the Holy Spirit plays upon the keys of the heart assuring that person beyond indirect evidence that you are a child of God. You see? You, you see? Uh, and so there are, there are two witnesses. Now suppose, suppose Wesley simply stressed the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit witnessing with our spirit that we're a child of God. What would be the danger there? In other words, uh, I'm not going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not going to look at conscience. I'm not going to look at obeying the commandments of Christ. I'm not going to look at any of that. I want to be in the Spirit. I want to be free. What's the problem with that? The problem could be, it could be fanaticism because you might begin to say, because you're not looking uh, at obedience and conscience and fruit of the Spirit, you could say, well, I'm in the Spirit and the Spirit is telling me to do this, to do X, and X is actually sinful, okay? Oh, but I'm in the Spirit. Well... Uh, the Holy Spirit will not contradict the truth of revelation, the truth of scripture, okay? And so there's the danger of fanaticism if we're simply stressing being in the spirit without also this indirect witness in terms of conscience, fruit of the spirit, obedience, obeying Christ, obeying the commandments of God, etc., etc., okay? Uh, have you not heard of stories in the church of people who argue they are led by the Holy Spirit uh, and they have done evil, they have done very bad things in the name of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, so you need a balance here, you need a check. And so once again, Wesley's theology is a conjunctive theology. It's both and, it's not either or. It's both the direct witness of the Holy Spirit because Paul talked about it. Uh, and then there is the indirect witness. If we stress the one, we can go off into fanaticism. 
if we stress simply the other, we can go off into formalism and self-justification, and self-justification. And so Wesley tries to find a balance here, a balance here, uh, and so this is what Wesley says. This is what he writes. Let none ever presume to rest in any supposed testimony of the Spirit which is separate from the fruit of it. And then he writes, secondly, let none rest in any supposed fruit of the Spirit without the witness. Without the witness. Okay? Uh, and so Wesley here uh, has a very nice balance. He has a very nice balance in terms of this uh, doctrine, uh, this doctrine of assurance, uh, this doctrine of hope, uh, the indirect witness as well as the direct witness. Okay. Uh, let me stop there. Uh, and entertain questions. Did everybody get to sign this today? I'll pass this around. Did you sign? Okay, good. All right. All right. Let's take some questions in the time that remains. Questions or comments that you might have. Yes. I have a question. Yes. When you talked a lot about sinning and sins and uh, when we are in Christ, we do not sin. Does Wesley ever uh, connect it or link it to what uh, Paul says in Romans 3? All have sinned and fall short of uh, the glory of God. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. the word uh, have sinned is in Greek, hamartia, which means like missing the mark or missing the target. Mm -hmm. And when Peter says that, make sure of uh, your election, you will not stumble. So does he ever talk about it, that it's not just something that I do or commit a sin or not do, but it's like more that uh, how to be free of sin because when you do what you're called for, because we all have the purpose, just like Jesus had, he didn't come just to show himself on the earth, but do something, <laughs> then it will help you when you have a purpose, you've you got to do something, just like running the race, you feel everything behind that makes you stumble, you put everything off, That's that's how you can be free of sin. Yeah. Not um, because it's proactive. Sin yeah. is always like means to do what we are called for. Yeah, I, I think that's helpful. And I think in terms of that scripture you started out with, all have sinned and, and have fallen short yeah. of the glory of God. I mean, that, that obviously is true. And what that statement is teaching is that we are all fallen. We are all in need of God's grace. Yeah, but I mean this hamartia there, that yeah. missing the mark, that sinning is... Missing the purpose that we have on earth. Yes, yes it is. Sin is, sin is a missing of the mark. Yeah. But along these lines, uh, there is that passage from Scripture, which is often quoted here in this context. Uh, uh, anyone who says uh, he has no sin deceives himself and the truth is not in him. Okay? Uh, and they use that to basically undermine what scripture is teaching in terms of the new birth. For example, what Paul is teaching and what John is teaching. But that verse means, and Wesley said, I think it's the 10th verse, explains the meaning of the 8th, or vice versa. I'd have to check the text again. Um, what that means is there's no one who can say, I have not sinned, okay? Because all are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God. But that verse does not say, that we all must continue and remain in our sins on a daily basis. You know, uh, he who says he you know, has not sinned has deceived himself and the truth is not in him. That means uh, no one can say, I have never sinned, I don't need grace, I don't need God, I don't need forgiveness, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. But what I meant, like, mostly was that uh does he connect it to, to fulfilling your purpose? Yes. Your, that yes. To live I, the holy life. You know? Yes. I think purpose or goal or telos, see that would be a good word here, telos, that the high goal that we have is the knowledge and love of God manifested in Jesus Christ, 
which is expressed in entire sanctification and heart purity. That would be one way to express it. Uh, the love of God and neighbor, the twofold commandment, as Jesus said, that would be another way to express it. That's the goal towards which we're aiming, towards which we're heading. And so in the living out of our Christian life, yes, we have that high goal and purpose before us. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, also the calling that each of uh, us have to do a certain, to be the, the member of body, like hand us something, foot us something. I mean, that kind of calling, that, that kind of purpose. Okay, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Maybe I'll think more about it, uh, and we'll talk some more tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I think I have a general sense, but maybe I need to reflect a bit more in terms of what you're saying. But I think your point, uh, your basic point, which is a good one, uh, this idea that of goal, of telos, of purpose, of the Christian life is directed towards a high end. Yes, all of that is very, very helpful because we are on a journey and we are ever growing and moving towards that, that high goal and high end, which is um, the love of God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. I mean, that's our goal, that's our high end towards which we are called. But I will think more about your, your question. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, any other questions and comments uh, that you might have? Um. Yes. This line between uh, between works, deeds, and works, and uh, salvation of the uh, yeah, salvation is so thin, like almost invisible. Uh, didn't people get confused again and again? Does do they have to? work for their salvation or Jesus will sense right away. Yeah, um, there is actually a technical distinction that Wesley makes in his theology. I didn't bring it forward to this class because it, it would be a higher level, a higher level of understanding. But it, it can be found in Wesley's sermon of the Scripture Way of Salvation, where Wesley is talking about faith and works, and he's talking about, he's writing about faith as in some sense necessary to salvation, but not necessary, now watch these two distinctions, not necessary in the same sense as faith, and not in the same degree. Now, if this were an upper level course, I would talk about those two distinctions, not in the same sense, not in the same degree, because what Wesley is doing in that distinction, uh, and you can take a look at this in the sermons that are in English translation and Estonian translation now, and maybe even in the smaller volume of Russian sermons, it might be there, Scripture Way of Salvation, by, this, by these two distinctions, not in the same sense, not in the same degree, Wesley is going to, on the one hand, affirm the importance of repentance and work suitable for repentance, okay? That if there be time and opportunity, we should do something because we have already received the prevenient grace of God, okay? But then, with the other distinction, he's going to argue that faith alone is absolutely necessary in order to justification. And it is the only thing that is absolutely necessary for justification. And so, with his second distinction, Wesley is affirming that we are justified by grace through faith alone. Let me express it this way. Let me express it this way. Maybe I can help you by looking at someone who is about to enter into entire sanctification uh, and then reflect back upon what is it like for someone to just be knocking on the door of justification and the new birth in terms of this issue of faith and works. 
And again, I'm referring to the sermon, The Scripture Way of Salvation, and towards the end of that sermon, Wesley writes, and he's thinking about a person on the way to entire sanctification. They're not entirely sanctified yet, but what should you do? You know, what, what should be? And he's thinking about faith and the importance of faith. And this is what he writes. If you think you must be or do something else first, then you are expecting salvation by works even unto this day. But if it is by the grace of God, expect it as you are and expect it now. And so there, Wesley is underscoring uh, the importance of entire sanctification by grace through faith alone. Okay? I'll get to you in a moment. I promise. Just, this is tough. Let me, let me just think this through here. Um, let me express it another way that cooperant grace, and this is where some people become frustrated, cooperant grace in terms of going up to justification and the new birth, it takes you up to the door, so to speak, but you don't enter the house. You don't enter the house. You're at the door. You're right there. Okay? But you don't enter the house. In the same way, with entire sanctification, cooperant grace, working together with God. God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. Cooperant grace takes us right up to the door, but it doesn't get us in. Because, because why? Because entire sanctification is a sheer gift. And because it is a gift, it is received by grace through faith alone. Wesley writes, exactly as we are justified by faith, so are we sanctified by faith. Faith is the condition and the only condition of sanctification exactly as it is of justification. Now your question. Yeah. Uh, I don't have really a question, it's a comment. Yes. To probably help with this a little more. Say, when we started from the Moravians and the quietness also, yes. Yes. and Wesley opposing it, if yes. you go to the modern terms, I get a person who is interested somehow, meet him there. So, of course, when I tell him the gospel or a friend, so then I go to my bookshelf and find the books, so read this, come next Sunday to the church, yes. Yes. and so on and so on, and it goes on for half a year yes. Yes. or whatever. So these are the works yes. what I think will be profit for his salvation mm -hmm. in, in a way. Right. I cannot save him and one day he comes to the conclusion in one meeting that God speaks to him and he gets saved. Mm -hmm. but, but anyhow, uh, to, it becomes complicated if we just try to explain, we come to modern terms today. Isn't it so? Do we evangelize somebody? We see that the person is interested in, so then we take other means to bring him closer and give him some works, for instance, to read or to do something else to help him move forward. I mean, that... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about a different topic or... No, no, I mean, that is just good pastoral practice, okay? okay? I mean, look at what Arthur Albrecht did with me. I said, I don't know Jesus Christ. I said, I'm a sinner. So what did he have me do? He said, read the Bible. He said, pray. He said, read John Wesley's sermons, which I did. He didn't tell me to just fold my hands and do nothing and just hope that I'm going to be saved. He told me to do certain things. Now, those things that I did, didn't, they didn't make me saved. Right, they didn't make me saved, but they they yeah. led to the path of salvation. They pointed in the they pointed in the direction of Christ. Okay, uh, because one is saved by grace through faith. Okay, and in the interim, there is something we can do. Okay, so you're struggling with this issue of faith and works, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, it's something we should be struggling with in the church because if you come to uh, a deeper understanding of this, 
it will be tremendously liberating. Tremendously li liberating because everything will be in its proper place. And there will be no excesses, no fanaticisms of quietism or of enthusiasm. And we will affirm, we will affirm that it is the grace of God. Uh, we're out of time.